Evelyn Zumaya rates Affairs Valentino. I am Evelyn Zumaya, the author of Affairs Valentino, and I want to read my book to you. From page 186, chapter 10, A Child's Resemblance. A few months later, New York City, June 1923. And my office now is Mr. George Ullman, the manager of Rudolph Valentino. I suggested that he meet with you to seek a solution to the contractual impasse. Attorney Max D. Stoyer paused in his telephone call to famous players Lasky's attorney, Emil Ludwig, to ask George, Today? George glanced at his pocket watch and nodded, Sure, four o'clock. George knew he barely had enough time to make that appointment with attorney Emil Ludwig, so he wasted no time leaving Max Stoyer's office at 42 Broadway. In his brand new role as Rudolph Valentino's business manager, George was entertaining no thoughts of professional failure. But with his first critical meeting with famous players Lasky only minutes away, he was feeling a shade less than invincible. During the short ride across Manhattan, he made every effort to bolster his confidence by reveling in his initial managerial victories. Retaining attorney Max Stoyer was one of the first orders of business George transacted on Rudy's behalf. Stoyer was a highly respected New York City attorney and once practiced law with the firm of Prince and Nathan, where he represented Blanca de Sales when she sued her husband for divorce. George retained Max Stoyer within hours of firing Rudy's attorney, Arthur Graham. He was adamant Graham had bilked Rudy out of tens of thousands of dollars while doing nothing to negotiate the stalemate with famous players Lasky. Arthur Graham did not go quietly, and upon learning of his termination, he instigated an angry exchange with his replacement, Max Stoyer. This occurred after Stoyer requested Graham surrender Rudy's entire case file. Graham responded by submitting a bill to Stoyer for an additional $27,000 for services rendered. He attached an ominous note to his hefty invoice, which stated that if payment was not received in full, he would not only retain possession of Rudy's case file, but release every snippet of confidential material in said file to the press. Max Stoyer fired back by dispatching a courier to hand-deliver a copy of the law's penalty for blackmail to Graham's office. Stoyer also attached a personal note to his correspondence, warning Graham that he would not hesitate to report his threat to the district attorney's office. After several more heated exchanges, it was Graham who finally conceded when he agreed to exchange his top-secret Valentino file for a settlement of $10,000. When George and Max Stoyer sat down to pore over Graham's Valentino file, they found it contained nothing more than newspaper clippings, a few court documents, and police records of Rudy's run-ins with the law during his early days in New York. George and Max Stoyer then turned their attention to Rudy's debt. As they made their initial review of his dire financial state of affairs, it was obvious Rudy had not the vaguest clue as to how to manage the business complexities of his success. They found no accounting system for any of his personal transactions or his several bank accounts. The result of Rudy's failure to document his financial situation was that he had no idea how much money he kept in these accounts. He also did not know the precise amount of money he owed to an army of despairing creditors. George and Max Stoyer found some evidence of Natasha's valiant efforts to bring order to her husband's chaotic paper trail. But it was also painfully clear that she was almost as devoid of any business acumen as Rudy. Neither Rudy or Natasha maintained consistent records of their transactions, and both carried overdue lines of credit. George tackled the bleak situation by organizing some form of effective bookkeeping system and instructing Stoyer to negotiate partial payments on the many accounts in arrears. He then focused upon the resolution of Rudy's dispute with the famous players Lasky Corporation. It was in the course of this endeavor, George found himself headed for a long overdue and guaranteed contentious confrontation with attorney Emil Ludwig.
As George stepped into the attorney's office that afternoon, he knew full well that the future of Rudy's movie career was contingent upon the outcome of that very meeting. After an obligatory handshake, George took the offensive and began presenting the terms of his proposal. Rudy would complete his contractual obligations with the famous Players Lasky Corporation by starring in two more films. For his work in these two movies, he would receive an increase in salary from the previous amount of $1,250 a week to $6,500 a week and would be granted complete artistic control over both films. With this said, George took a deep breath and prepared to fight for the terms he had just outlined. To his utter amazement and relief, Emil Ludwig agreed to his proposal without hesitation. The attorney informed George that Rudy's final two films with famous players, Lasky, would not be filmed in Hollywood, but at the studio's lot in nearby Queens, New York. George countered by demanding Rudy receive an additional $500 a week for living expenses as he would be required to live in New York during filming. Ludwig agreed to this request, but stipulated Rudy's salary would not begin until his first day of filming and would end the day the second picture was completed. Over the course of the next hour, George and Emil Ludwig got down to the business of negotiating the specifics of the proposed contract. When George was satisfied his business with Ludwig was complete, he slid his notes into his briefcase and prepared to leave. It was then the attorney asked him to please wait just one moment while he placed a telephone call to famous players Lasky's vice president in charge of production, Jesse Lasky. Ludwig asked Lasky if he could please stop by his office to review the tentative agreement he'd just worked out with Rudolph Valentino's manager. The prospect of an unexpected face-to-face -face with Lasky took George by surprise. He braced himself for a possible row with the man Rudy had been impugning to his mineral avatar audiences on a nightly basis for the past three months. In George's brief career as a professional boxer, he'd learned a thing or two about the fine art of absorbing a punch. He drew upon this knowledge as Jesse Lasky entered Emil Ludwig's office a few minutes later. He greeted the executive with an awkward handshake, but Lasky did not say hello, did not look him in the eye, and said nothing. He just grabbed the proposed contract and began to read. He read in silence for a few minutes, handed the papers back to Emil Ludwig, and then turned to address George, saying, I don't want anything to do with Valentino. You will make these pictures. With this reprimand, Lasky abruptly left the office. George was at a loss for words and stared at Emil Ludwig for a long moment before saying with apprehension, That was just a figure of speech, I'm sure. Ludwig gave George a matter of fact, No, he means it. George replied sheepishly that he knew nothing about the production of motion pictures. Ludwig's response was a nonchalant, You'll learn. The attorney then concluded the meeting by placing another brief phone call to the studio manager at the lot in Queens. A new producer, George Ullman, is on his way to meet with you. George was dumbfounded. Only an hour earlier, he was feeling his way into a new field of employment about which he knew relatively little, celebrity management. As he left Emil Ludwig's office and headed for the famous player's Lasky studio lot in Queens, he realized he had just become a movie producer. While embarking upon his sudden crash course in motion picture production, George continued to negotiate the terms of Rudy's new contract and devise a plan to reverse his sure spin downwards into financial ruin. Step one of George's strategy was to establish a corporate alter ego for Rudy, which would shield him from lawsuits and allow all of his private and professional transactions to be conducted under the protection of a business. George and Max Steuer established Rudy's corporate alter ego with the purchase of a research laboratory, Cosmic Arts Incorporated. As soon as Rudy affixed his signature to the documents, he became the new owner of Cosmic Arts Incorporated and began funding the research of the laboratory's two scientists, Albert Lambert and Jean Gauthier. Lambert and Gauthier benefited from the arrangement as they were able to continue their experimentation 
while George was able to assign all of Rudy's future contracts to the ownership of Cosmic Arts Incorporated. As owner of the laboratory, Rudy also held legal ownership of the scientists' patent on their process called the Lambert process. Ten shares of Cosmic Arts stock were issued at the time Rudy purchased the laboratory, and all ten shares were immediately signed over to Natasha's ownership. She then assumed her role as the laboratory's sole stockholder and president of Rudy's newly formed corporation. George acted as secretary and treasurer and was contractually assured a 10% commission of any profits he might generate from the sale of the Lambert process patent. By incorporating Cosmic Arts as a Delaware corporation, Rudy joined many other Americans at the time who were taking full advantage of Delaware's lenient incorporation laws. It was not long after Rudy assumed ownership of Cosmic Arts Incorporated that George began negotiating with enterprising independent motion picture producer J.D. Williams. Williams made the initial contact with George to inform him that he and several other wealthy New Yorkers wanted to form a production company, Ritz-Carlton Pictures, with the sole intention of producing Rudy's independent movies as soon as he was contractually free from famous players Lasky. After reviewing the offer, George advised Rudy that it would be wise to negotiate some sort of deal with Williams. He assured Rudy that the terms of any contract negotiated with Williams Ritz-Carlton Pictures would be precisely those he was close to securing from famous players Lasky, complete control over all phases of production and final word on the selection of stories, writers, directors, editing, and casting. Rudy heeded his new manager's advice, and George and J.D. Williams were soon hashing out the details of the deal. After the initial round of discussions, George requested a $25,000 retainer for Rudy as a sign of good faith from Williams' new production company. When Rudy and George deposited Williams' $25,000 retainer in the 42nd Street branch of the National City Bank, Rudy surprised George and the bank teller by depositing only $14,000. He then requested 11 crisp $1,000 bills as change and told George that they were cabbing directly from the bank to the office of producer Joe Godsell at the Metro Goldwyn building. George knew that Frank Manillo advanced Rudy a great deal of money over the years, but until that day he had no idea Godsell also acted as an underwriter. As soon as the debt to Godsell was cleared, George suggested to Rudy that he immediately wire payments to some of his many creditors. Rudy wasn't sold on this idea and said he planned to spend the remainder of William's retainer on his impending European honeymoon. In the days before Rudy left on his honeymoon, he and George attended to one other pressing order of business. On July 6th, they met in Max Steuer's office and signed two contracts. One contract officially hired George as Rudy's business manager, and a second contract granted George full power of attorney. About the same time George was signing these contracts, he was also concluding negotiations on Rudy's new contracts with both famous players Lasky and J.D. Williams' Ritz-Carlton Pictures. These contracts guaranteed that upon Rudy's return from his honeymoon, he would begin work in two movies with famous players Lasky and then embark upon the production of his first independent movies with Ritz-Carlton Pictures. The welcome news that Rudy was at last returning to the movies was officially released to the public, and Rudy and Natasha were elated with George's efforts. He appeared to be solving all of the troublesome issues that had been plaguing Rudy's career for years. As the happy couple put the finishing touches on their honeymoon, they were relieved to see George bringing order to their financial affairs in Los Angeles and in New York. They encouraged him to assume complete authority over their professional dealings, as well as their personal finances. Unfortunately, as George bore down on the business of policing the couple's personal finances, he grew increasingly unpopular with Natasha. Initially, she embraced the luxury of having George tote the cash and enjoyed the convenience of delegating him with the responsibility of dealing with all of those pesky bill collectors. However, 
Natasha's satisfaction with her husband's new business manager would be fleeting. And as his influence over their finances and Rudy intensified, so would her resentment of George's very presence in their lives. The Valentino's European honeymoon taught George one important lesson about Rudy and Natasha. Never hand them an open line of credit. It was just such a letter of credit George secured for them before their departure. In doing so, he granted the happy honeymooners the ability to spend with reckless abandon. On July 23rd, just as news of Rudy's triumphant return to the movies became front-page news, he and Natasha jostled their way through a crush of reporters and fans swarming the gangplank of the ocean liner, the Aquitania. As official honeymooners, they were armed and ready with not only the remainder of J.D. Williams' retainer, but with George's letter of credit directing all charges to his office in New York City. Ten years had passed since Rudy's first transatlantic crossing. As an 18-year-old, he spent most of that first voyage anxious over his arrival in America and envious of the privileged treatment bestowed upon the ship's most wealthy passengers. He made that journey in the dead of winter and endured rough seas and frigid temperatures. On his return voyage in the summer of 1923, he and his elegant wife luxuriated in first-class accommodations, traveled with unlimited financial resource, and enjoyed the company of a small entourage, including Aunt Teresa Warner and photographer James Abbey. The Aquitania's captain and staff pampered the famous movie star and his wife with VIP attention, usually reserved for traveling royalty. Towering, fresh floral arrangements and neatly tied bundles of telegrams were courteously delivered to their stateroom each morning. In addition to George's daily communiques, Rudy and Natasha received numerous invitations requesting their personal appearance upon their arrival in England. When the Aquitania docked in Cherbourg, Aunt Teresa parted company with her niece and Rudy in order to continue on her journey south to the Riviera and the Hudnut Chateau. The Aquitania steamed on towards Southampton, with the two famous honeymooners not entirely sure what reception to expect upon their arrival. As soon as they set foot on the British Isle, they realized Rudy's English fans shared the same fanaticism for his movies as their counterparts on the other side of the pond. Despite a torrential rain, over 1,000 screaming fans crowded London's train station to greet the Valentinos. Rudy signed autographs for nearly an hour before he and Natasha made their getaway in a waiting limousine. Outside the Carlton Hotel, more crowds of fans milled in the street below the Valentino's suite window. And after Rudy mentioned to the British press that he planned to purchase a few new suits while visiting London, a procession of Saville Row tailors wedged their way into the crowds outside the Carlton. While visiting England, Rudy and Natasha toured abbeys and museums, attended the theatre, and were wined and dined by London's elite. They visited Natasha's boarding school, Leatherhead Court, and journeyed on to Surrey and the Pekingese kennels of Mrs. Ashton Cross. After a thorough review of Mrs. Cross's newest litter, Natasha purchased three of the peaks at the steep price of $1,500 a pup. She instructed Mrs. Cross to forward her invoice for payment to Mr. George Allman in New York City. Rudy surpassed Natasha's extravagance with the purchase of 20 suits and a new wardrobe of shirts, hats, and riding boots. Receipts for these purchases were also forwarded to George's office. George responded by wiring the carefree honeymooners with pleas they exercise fiscal restraint. Rudy and Natasha made a meager effort to oblige by making minimal deposits on some purchases and signing for the balance on credit. Soon it was time to leave London for Paris by boarding an airplane for a turbulent flight to Paris's Le Bourget Airport. Upon their arrival in Paris, they received a cablegram from George reporting the news that Rudy's first film with famous players Lasky would be Booth Tarkington's novel Monsieur Bocaire. Natasha and Rudy were thrilled with the choice, as Tarkington's popular novel would afford Rudy the opportunity to portray both the roles of the Duke of Chartres and his alias, Monsieur Beaucaire. 
They felt a period costume drama set in the court of Louis XV to be a perfect fit for Rudy, and he would perform several first-rate sword duels. As Rudy and Natasha checked into Paris's Hotel Plaza Athene, their honeymoon assumed the added dynamic of research and planning for the production of Monsieur Beaucaire. If Rudy left London's finest tailors sated with his outrageous orders, Natasha exceeded his extravagance in the salon of French courtier Paul Poiret. She spent days adrift in Poiret's salon, where she modeled his latest creations before photographer James Abbey's camera. Natasha and designer Paul Poiret also spent a great deal of time poring over her preliminary sketches for Monsieur Beaucaire's costumes. In very short order, Natasha commissioned the designer to create 60 costumes for the film. When George received Natasha's cablegram with news of Poiret's mighty commission, he was off to famous players Lasky's offices to request additional funding to pay Poiret's expert tailors. During Rudy and Natasha's visit to Paris, the director of the Théâtre des Champs-Élysées, Jacques Iberto, assumed the role of tour guide par excellence. Monsieur Iberto hosted lavish A-list dinner parties in their honor and organized a road trip to his native city of Deauville in the province of Normandy. He timed the drive to Deauville to coincide with the Grand Prix road race. When stormy weather resulted in the cancellation of the annual race, Rudy made the best of the change in plans by gambling in Deauville's casino. The cordial relations between the Valentinos and Monsieur Iberto cooled when Rudy refused to leave the action at the roulette wheel long enough to accompany his host and Natasha on a tour of a few nearby muddy battlefields. Before the honeymooners left Paris for the Riviera and the Hudnut Chateau, they placed an order for a luxury custom vehicle for Natasha, and he sought the Fraschini Cabriolet. Natasha's two-seated Cabriolet Roadster would be a scaled-down replica of Rudy's full-size Isotta Fraschini limousine and shipped directly to New York upon its completion. Rudy then made the purchase of the vehicle of his dreams, a Voisin Avion Roadster. During the summer of 1923, the Voisin Avions were indisputably the world's most coveted automobiles. The custom-built roadsters were each personally designed by French aviation engineer Gabriel Voisin, and his wealthy clientele paid ten times the price of an average family car for one of his masterpieces of aerodynamic design and art deco artistry. When Rudy placed his order, he discovered he and Gabriel Voisin shared a common passion. They were both tinkerers. Consequently, when the two men got down to the discussion of each minute detail of Rudy's new Voisin, the negotiations continued for several days. They debated the use of flush bronze rivets, sketched several designs for custom door latches, and weighed the advantages and disadvantages of an automatic jacking system. Gabriel Voisin suggested the installation of an extra foot pedal in order to bypass the motor's a silencer mechanism to allow for more engine power. This prompted Rudy to spend hours under Voisin's personal roadster examining this complicated feature. With a final selection of gunmetal gray exterior paint and vermilion Moroccan leather upholstery, Rudy's order was at last a fait accompli. As the custom automobile could not be completed for months, Gabriel Vassin offered Rudy the use of one of his private vehicles for the remainder of his honeymoon. Rudy's first run at the wheel of the Vassin loner was the 600-mile drive from Paris south to Jean Le Pen on the French Riviera and the Hudnut Estate. With the powerful vehicle crammed with satchels, trunks, and three excitable Pekingese puppies, Rudy and Natasha left Paris to embark upon an exhilarating ride towards the Mediterranean coast. After spending years repairing leaking, burned-out engines, Rudy reveled in this state-of-the-art automobile. His enjoyment of this occasion was not tempered by his lack of expertise in the handling of such a responsive machine. With a leaden foot, he sped along the highway, thrashing the gears, wrenching the huge steering wheel, slamming on the brakes, and terrifying his wife. A wind-blown Natasha and her three puppies were flung left and right, 
and it wasn't long before Rudy's ham-fisted navigation took its toll on all of their nervous systems. Natasha pleaded with her husband to slow down, but the roar of the Voisson's engine was deafening, the road dust suffocating, and her protests went unheeded. A few hours into the journey, Rudy accelerated up another steep incline, just as the road before him disappeared suddenly. In an effort to avoid a plunge into the abyss beyond, he stood upright on the brake. With a force challenging even Gabriel Vasson's expert engineering, he spun the steering wheel in a hard right turn. Natasha shrieked as the car rocked to a stop with its left rear wheel spinning over the cliff's edge. Before the smoke and dust cleared, Rudy leaned towards his wife, who sat pale, trembling and staring straight ahead. Did you see him? he whispered. Did you see Black Feather when he helped me turn the wheel? Natasha stared straight ahead and said nothing. For the remainder of the drive, she resigned herself to her fate and barely uttered another word. It was nearly ten o'clock that evening when Uncle Dickie, Mother Muzzy, and Aunt Teresa heard the Voisson rumbling up the chateau's driveway. This was Rudy's first visit, and despite being filthy with road soot and exhausted from the long drive, he insisted upon a grand tour of the palatial estate. He learned Uncle Dickie purchased the 20-room chateau in 1914, and Muzzy informed her son-in-law that she personally decorated the chateau's interiors in the style of Louis XVI. She was eager to add that in anticipation of their arrival, she renovated a bedroom especially for them in brilliant colors and modern lacquered furniture. Muzzy also pointed out how she filled their eclectic room with armloads of fragrant tuberoses from the chateau's gardens. The sun, sea, and seclusion of Juan Le Pen would provide an idyllic retreat for Rudy and Natasha. The stately environs became the perfect setting for Rudy to begin a smooth transformation into his next screen character, the aristocratic Monsieur Bocquer. When photographer James Abbey arrived from Paris to visit the Valentinos, he captured some of the immediate effects of how life at the Chateau was influencing Rudy. He had retired his Seville rose suits to sport casual white slacks, open shirts, and a beret. While he assumed the subtle characteristics of Booth Tarkington's privileged French nobleman on the French Riviera, on the steamy streets of New York City, producer George Ullman was preparing to hire his first director. What do you think of Rudolph Valentino, George asked director Sidney Olcott. I think he's a very talented young man, but very much un misunderstood. I like him, replied Olcott. George had been waiting a week for Sidney Olcott's arrival in New York and was eager to have the director agree to join the project. When he initially contacted Olcott, the director was working in Hollywood. Olcott wired George, saying he would travel to New York immediately to discuss the possibility of directing Monsieur Bouquet. George was impressed by Olcott's direction of Marion Davis' film, Little Old New York, and felt confident he was the perfect director to handle Rudy's crucial return performance. Not long after meeting with George, Olcott accepted the position of director, and the two men then turned their attentions to the selection of a screenplay writer. Sidney Olcott suggested George contact a screenwriter he knew in Brooklyn, New York, Forrest Halsey. It took little convincing to bring Halsey on board the project, and he was soon hard at work transforming Monsieur Bocquer into a suitable screenplay. Every few days he delivered a few pages of the script to George's office for review. Despite George's limited knowledge of film production, he was acutely aware that Natasha was assuming an executive role in Bocquer's pre-production, and doing so while on her honeymoon. It was with trepidation he read her daily cablegrams, as they inevitably included her demands for an increase in his prudent budget. With famous players Lasky's executives counting the days until they could kiss both of the Valentinos a goodbye forever, each time George presented them with a fresh request for more funding for Monsieur Bocquer, he was greeted by stony resistance. So he was hardly surprised when he read another lengthy wire from Natasha informing him of her great discovery. She wrote how, through her friend Jacques Eberto, she met a young newspaper reporter, Andre Dauvin. 
Her wire instructed George to secure a role for Monsieur Dauvin in Monsieur Beaucaire, as she had already invited him to travel to New York and appear in the film. This particular cablegram from Natasha would not have been as troubling for George had it not been for Natasha's demand that all of Monsieur Dauvin's expenses for this trip be paid in full by Rudy. As George surveyed the fresh stack of Rudy and Natasha's incoming unpaid invoices, he was stunned with this development. He dispatched an immediate wire of response, informing Natasha that it would be financially impossible to offer Monsieur Dauvin an all-expense-paid trip. But George's protest arrived too late. Andre Dauvin was already Natasha's newest protege, and any further discussion of the matter was closed. George let the issue of Monsieur Dauvin's impending visit slide, as he was preoccupied with more pressing concerns that August. He was not only supervising the writing of Beaucaire's screenplay and the construction of the sets in Queens, but organizing the Mineral Lava beauty pageant scheduled to take place in November. And on August 13th, his wife B gave birth to their second son, Robert Warren, Bobby. With two children and a wife to support, George was focused upon his job at hand, and failure on any level was no option. Only ten days after Rudy's arrival at the Hudnut Chateau, he decided to make the short drive to Italy, in the Voisson, with Natasha and Aunt Teresa. Around noon on the first day of this road trip, Rudy slowed the Voisson for the border crossing at Ventimiglia. A customs officer sidled up to the impressive automobile to announce that it was his lunch hour and he was about to go off duty for the next two hours. The guard shuffled around the car while eyeing the several boxes of imported cigarettes tossed on the back seat. He informed the three travelers they would have to wait for the next two hours as the border was officially closed. Rudy responded with disgust by throwing his cigarette into the dusty road. The guard bristled at Rudy's defiance, and this inspired an exchange of hand gestures and Italian expletives between the two men. For two long hours, Rudy, Natasha, and Aunt Teresa could do little else but wait and fume. Around two o'clock, the guard reappeared, and Rudy renewed his demands that he be allowed to cross the border. The guard agreed to do so only if a hefty duty was paid on those boxes of cigarettes. This infuriated Rudy, and he shouted at the guard. As an Italian citizen, he owed exactly nothing. Hearing this, the guard nodded towards Natasha and made a crack how Rudy could well afford to pay the duty on the cigarettes, as he was obviously married to an heiress. This insult set Rudy over the boiling point, and he pulled a fistful of cash from his pocket. He slammed the money in the guard's hand, threw the Vassan into gear, and roared down the road in a cloud of dust. For ten years he had envisioned his glorious return to Italian soil, but after a two-hour wait and an angry encounter with the guard, the actual moment of his return slipped by unnoticed. He drove for an hour along the Italian Riviera before stopping at a roadside inn. The three weary travelers were seated at a table on the inn's terrace where a melancholy Rudy downed several glasses of wine. Natasha and Aunt Teresa were surprised by his obvious distress upon his much-anticipated return to his homeland. Apparently, the radiant vista of the Mediterranean Sea was only adding to his despair. Over another glass of wine, he began a soulful narration of the circumstances of his departure from Italy ten years earlier, by divulging the details of a contentious Guglielmi family gathering just before he sailed for America. He recalled how during that meeting his aunts and uncles wagged their fingers in his face and shouted at him for bringing shame upon his dear mother and the family's good name. As Rudy shared the story with Natasha and Aunt Teresa, they could see he was still anguishing over the sorry events of that day long ago. He continued his story by saying his angry relatives came to a quick consensus. He should leave his hometown of Taranto and travel as far away as soon as possible. Aunt Teresa pressed him for specifics of this crime that so shamed his family, but Rudy did not respond. Instead, he explained that his family was adamant he leave immediately, even though his abrupt departure meant crossing the Atlantic Ocean during the bitter cold of winter. <laughs> 
As he recalled this unhappy occasion, Rudy's gaze fixated upon a distant point in the evening sky, and Natasha noticed his eyes brimming with tears. Rudy concluded the dreary tale by saying his relatives pooled their resources to raise the necessary funds for his passage, and sent a cablegram to family friends Frank and Chiro Manillo in New York City, alerting them to his arrival. Despite Natasha and Aunt Teresa's many questions, Rudy was through reminiscing. He informed them abruptly that he wanted to drive on to Genoa to spend the night and then motor on to Milan the following morning to visit his sister Maria. It was not long after this tearful reunion with his sister Maria the following day that evidence of the siblings' ten years of separation became apparent. Maria's world-famous brother had done well for himself while she lived a simple life and seldom ventured more than a few miles from her provincial home. She was critical of her new sister-in-law and informed her that in Italy no respectable woman ever wore a glove over her wedding ring or makeup, perfume, and brightly colored clothing during the day. Maria's instructions failed to motivate any alteration in Natasha's fashion or behavior. Instead, Natasha took it upon herself to buy her plain-looking sister-in-law a colorful new outfit. Decked out in her fashion upgrade, Maria joined her brother, Natasha, and Teresa Warner when they journeyed further south to Rome and on to Campobasso to visit their older brother, Alberto. Somewhere on the road between Siena and Florence, Rudy turned the Voisson into the drive of a farmhouse advertising rooms for the night. The farmhouse was old world-worn, and the floor of Natasha and Rudy's bedroom sloped at a precarious angle. The room's only furnishings were a bed and one rickety milking stool. Their double bed was piled so high with feather bedding that a small wooden ladder had to be positioned for the climb. In the silence of their farmhouse bedroom that night, Natasha lit a few candles and climbed the ladder to sit on the bed with her husband. He'd already covered the bedspread with sheets of blank paper and was preparing to receive his evening's messages from the other side. As he sat with his eyes closed, he wrote long messages from his mother, Mesalope, and Blackfeather. His three contacts from the other side apparently had a great deal to say, and he wrote late into the night, long after Natasha crawled under the feather bedding and fell to sleep. In remote rural Italian villages, neither Rudy nor his films were known. Consequently, he was not recognized, and there were no crowds of shrieking female fans seeking autographs. This was not the case when he arrived in Rome, where he was greeted as an international celebrity and escorted about the city by notable figures of the Italian cinema. He and Natasha were entertained on the set of the film Quo Vadis and dined with the German star of the film, Emil Jannings. And as Maria had never seen any of her brother's films, a private showing of The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse was arranged for her benefit. When Rudy announced he was leaving Rome and heading south to Campobasso, Natasha stunned her traveling companions by saying she had no intention of continuing on to visit Alberto and his family. Despite what anyone said to convince her otherwise, she could not be dissuaded, and she boarded a train bound for Jean Le Pen. Several different explanations for Natasha's abrupt return to France at this juncture have been presented over the years. It has been alleged she became pregnant during her honeymoon, and Rudy's wild driving caused her to miscarry their unborn child. It has also been reported she was unable to tolerate the stress of the road trip over Italy's rural roads. But perhaps Natasha left for France because she was well aware of the dynamic awaiting her in Campobasso and was emotionally unwilling to face that particular reality of Rudy's past. When 10-year-old Jean Vittorio Gabriele Adalberto Guglielmi first laid his piercing dark eyes on his famous uncle, he ran straight into his arms and hugged him so tightly around the neck that Rudy wept openly. Everyone witnessing their first encounter could not help but recognize the emotional significance of the moment. Although Jean shared certain facial characteristics with both his grandfather and Alberto, his distinctive, intense eyes and sinewy hands were certainly Rudy's. This was not the only notable likeness to his uncle Rudy. Jean exhibited the same restive personality and irrepressible interest in all things mechanical, 
Rudy recognized these traits as his own and tagged Gene with his childhood nickname of Mucurio, or Quicksilver. Rudy and Gene were inseparable during the visit, and the two spent hours tinkering on a bicycle, which Rudy purchased and riding around the narrow stone streets of Campo Basso in the Voisin. At the time, Alberto was employed as a local village clerk and living in a modest home. Although he was pleased initially to reunite with his famous younger brother, he rejected Rudy's invitation to join him on a drive further south to the town of their birth, Castellaneta. It was soon apparent to both Rudy and Aunt Teresa that neither Alberto nor his sister Maria held any interest in returning to Castellaneta. Nevertheless, Rudy made his preparations to leave Campobasso. Young Jean was stricken at the news of his uncle's departure, but Rudy promised the boy he would soon send passage for him to visit him in America. He also assured Alberto he would forward money to pay for Jean's piano lessons and continued schooling. Affectionate family photos were snapped, tearful goodbyes were said, and Rudy and Aunt Teresa loaded the Voisin for the drive to Castellaneta. Castellaneta is situated in the instep of the boot of Italy, and during the summer of 1923, few visitors ever ventured to visit the remote outpost. Consequently, when Rudy's great automobile rolled into town, he and Aunt Teresa were the targets of many townsfolk's suspicious glares. Rudy ignored the sinister welcome and happily pointed out all of the landmarks of his childhood to Aunt Teresa, the great view of the sea and the whitewashed stucco home where he was born. He parked the Voisin outside the local church of San Michele to pay a visit to the local priest. The priest greeted him with a less than warm reception. He chastised Rudy for leaving his homeland and suggested he might atone for his actions by making a sizable donation to the church right there on the spot. Aunt Teresa nudged Rudy towards the Voisin, but he insisted upon snapping one more photograph of his boyhood home. By then, a group of townsfolk surrounded the vehicle and began shaking their fists in the air and spitting on the ground. Rudy got the message and executed his speedy getaway from the town of his birth. He drove hard, due north to Campobasso. There, he paused briefly to allow his sister Maria to join him on the return drive to the chateau. Upon his arrival at Joan Le Pen, Rudy found Natasha once again upbeat and energized as she shared George's encouraging cablegrams from New York. Aunt Teresa was grateful to see Rudy and Natasha in such high spirits and said nothing about the depressing return to Castellaneta. She left the details of that trip to Rudy, who related a heavily edited version of the actual events. George's many cablegrams urged the honeymooners to return to New York post-haste. He explained that under the terms of Rudy's contract with famous players Lasky, he would not receive his next paycheck until he arrived for his first day of work. With the bills pouring in from their honeymoon deluxe, George wired, head home, the honeymoon is now over. Rudy and Natasha heeded his advice and were soon settling into their stateroom on board the Belgenland. Ten days later, George stood on the deck of a tugboat, watching the Belgenland steam up the Hudson River. He received permission from New York's harbor master to ride out on the tug in order to board the great ocean liner before it docked. Rudy and Natasha were surprised and overjoyed to see George striding towards them on the deck, and he found them both to be well-rested and excited to be returning to New York. He shared every detail of the luxurious new suite he had just leased for them at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel, and as a proud new father, he told them all about the birth of his baby boy, Bobby. Rudy was so elated to hear about little Bobby's arrival, he insisted on becoming the baby's godfather. On a handshake aboard the Belgenland, Rudy's wish was granted. As Rudy, Natasha, and George prepared to pass through customs, Rudy handed George a large and unwieldy camera. George toted the camera through customs and all the way back to the hotel suite, where Rudy finally relieved him of the heavy load by saying, Do you know, George, that you are now a smuggler? Before George could answer such an odd question, Rudy unscrewed the lens of the camera and a large uncut diamond tumbled into his hand. He was elated with the success of his latest gamble and handed the gem to Natasha.
She was so blasé about the precious stone that George knew immediately she was in on the subterfuge. Realizing his role as smuggler, George insisted they return to customs at once and declare the gem. It was only after Rudy swore he would smuggle no more that George decided to let the incident slide. He was more anxious to hear the reaction to a copy of Forrest Halsey's Monsieur Beaucaire screenplay, which he had tucked in his coat pocket. Rudy was too keyed up to give the script more than a cursory glance and pass the rolled-up papers to Natasha. Unlike Rudy, she sat down and read with intense interest, began notating changes on each page, and remarked to George that screenwriter Halsey made several critical errors with his entrances and exits. Rudy was animated and in no mood to discuss work. Instead, he busied himself by summoning room service and placing an order for a can of the hotel's finest Russian caviar. He then informed George they would spend that evening toasting their return to New York in his favorite way, by eating a can of caviar with a large spoon and drinking one of the flasks of whiskey George thoughtfully stashed about the suite. George declined Rudy's invitation, saying he was headed home to be in the boys. But when he received the first week's invoice from the Valentino's rich Carlton suite, he realized Rudy's toasting of his return to New York continued longer than that one evening. The caviar bill alone for Rudy's first week in New York totaled over $100. It was during this same week George issued daily press releases in an effort to promote Rudy's return to the movies. He deemed this publicity not only critical to Monsieur Beaucaire's success, but to the reinventing of Rudy's image. George crafted his press releases with the intention of transforming the public's perception of Rudy from that of marauding, sex-obsessed chic to the courtly Monsieur Beaucaire. It was imperative he elevate Rudy's image in the eyes of his public, and with this in mind, George ensured Rudy was photographed with pipe in hand and eyes focused upon the pages of a weighty tome. Privately, George knew Rudy seldom read anything other than sports magazines, and that E.M. Hall's The Sheik was the only book he acknowledged he ever read cover to cover. Other than a cursory perusal of a book as a prospective screen project, or a scan of an auction catalog, Rudy never read. Nevertheless, George began publicizing him as a teetotaling studious professorial intellectual and seized every opportunity to meld Rudy's public persona with his next on-screen character. Instead of being portrayed as a desert chieftain and an irresistible sexual force, Rudy began to resemble a refined, bookish philosopher, with each press release, his public image grew more scholarly, and as the gap between his new Rudy as advertised and his actual self widened, he felt the pressure to measure up. He confided in George that he was embarrassed about his lack of formal education and asked him to buy a few college textbooks for his use. George assuaged Rudy's anxiety with the purchase of several textbooks which he noticed were by and large left unread around the Valentino's apartment and Rudy's dressing room on the studio lot in Queens. When George noticed that these textbooks, as well as other personal belongings, were disappearing from Rudy's dressing room, he posted a security guard around the clock outside the door. While George struggled with these safety issues, Natasha began meeting with Monsieur Beaucaire's director, Sidney Olcott, and screenwriter Forrest Halsey. Olcott and Halsey listened patiently as she outlined a litany of instructions regarding all aspects of production. George was less accommodating, and most of his meetings with Natasha erupted into heated arguments and ended with considerable door slamming. With one wary eye on the film's hemorrhaging budget, George received Natasha's directives as just more delay and outrageous expenditure. Much to Natasha's distress, Rudy never intervened in his manager and wife's angry tete-a-tetes, and more often than not, it was George who acquiesced. Although George spent most of his days absorbed in Beaucaire's pre-production, by the end of November he was also attending to the last details of the Mineralava beauty pageant scheduled to be held in Madison Square Garden. The 88 beauty queens were converging upon New York City, and preparing to compete for the title of America's Queen of Beauty, 
By November 27th, the dazzling young women had all safely arrived and were backstage adjusting their banners. It was showtime. The New York City Mounted Police patrolling Madison Square Garden that chilly night would earn their pay as they worked feverishly to restrain the crowds from crashing through the barricades. When Rudy's limousine arrived, a police lieutenant on the scene made the executive decision to close the street for the movie star's safety. While Rudy waited in the limousine for the police to clear the street, spotlights swept across the night sky and inside Madison Square Garden, Every seat was taken. For the past seven months, George and B. Ullman worked side by side, organizing the beauty pageant. In addition to arranging the details required to hold such an event in Madison Square Garden, they coordinated the contestants' transportation from their hometowns to New York City, arranged their hotel accommodations, and assigned each contestant an individual chaperone. During the early phases of planning, George was concerned. By sending the contestants cash or a prepaid rail ticket, they might pocket the money and never arrive in New York. He devised a solution to this potential problem by negotiating a deal with the railroad. He prepaid the contestants tickets and in return the railroad instructed their conductors to accept each contestant's signature in lieu of a ticket. The arrangement went off without a hitch, and every contestant arrived on time. George and B. also organized a short excursion by train from New York to Washington, D.C. for the 88 American Beauties. There, each contestant and her chaperone shook hands with President Calvin Coolidge before returning to New York City. Their busy schedule then required their participation in a parade up Fifth Avenue to 59th Street, and a fleet of cars George leased from a local automobile agency. B. Ullman worked diligently with her husband, organizing the Mineralava pageant, and she was personally in charge of all hotel arrangements, chaperones, and discipline. With the night's festivities only minutes away, a young, aspiring producer, David O. Selznick, hurried to position his movie camera and lights in order to film a short documentary of the event. When Rudy finally made his entrance into Madison Square Garden, he walked on stage to remind a cheering audience that he had but a single vote on a panel of judges. He then returned to his seat to view the contestants as they made their first promenade down the runway. After this initial review, Rudy took the microphone again to announce the semi-finalists. From these contestants, five finalists were chosen. Miss Los Angeles was an early favorite, and Miss New York, in black velvet and pearls, received raucous support from her hometown crowd. When it came time to crown the winner of America's Queen of Beauty, Rudy bestowed the title upon none other than Miss Norma Niblock from Toronto, Canada. His seemingly random choice generated a wave of response backstage, and some wondered about Rudy's alleged single vote on the panel of judges. The uproar was in response to his naming a foreigner as America's beauty queen, but also due to the fact that his brief relationship with Miss Niblock in Toronto was by then common knowledge among the other 87 contestants. With David O. Selznick's camera and George's eyes rolling, Rudy winked at his Canadian queen of beauty and planted the platinum and diamond tiara upon her pretty head. The Mineralava pageant completed Rudy's contractual obligation with the Mineralava Company, and he was then free to devote his full attention to the production of Monsieur Beaucaire. But no sooner had work begun in earnest on the set in Queens than the announcement was made that Natasha felt the script needed extensive work. It was also announced that while the script was being retooled, the star of the film and his wife would be traveling again to France and Jean Le Pen for the Christmas holiday. On this journey, Rudy and Natasha sailed the Atlantic on separate ocean liners, with Rudy arriving in France ten days before Natasha. His new contracts were about to be assigned ownership to Cosmic Arts Incorporated, and as sole stockholder of Cosmic Arts, Natasha was required to remain in New York to affix her signature to the necessary paperwork. Why Rudy refused to remain in New York in order to travel with his wife remains a mystery, 
but perhaps some tiff inspired him to sail solo. When he arrived in Paris, he was greeted by Aunt Teresa, and by the time Natasha arrived to join them on the drive south to the Riviera, it was Christmas Eve. While Rudy's fans lurked outside his empty dressing room in Queens, while the press debated whether he still had enough box office drawing power to score a major hit, while Paul Poiret's tailors put the finishing touches on their 60 costumes, and while screenwriter Forrest Halsey hunched over his typewriter in Brooklyn, the star of Monsieur Beaucaire and his wife Natasha welcomed 1924 by getting plastered at a party in their honor at the Hotel Negresco in Nice. Muzzy and Uncle Dickie were also guests at the New Year's Eve soiree. Sometime on the 1923 side of midnight, Muzzy passed by the hotel's piano bar, where she spotted her son-in-law engaged in some questionable behavior. She informed her daughter she best get in there and do something quickly. When Natasha found Rudy, he was kneeling on the barroom floor and jabbing the air with a cane. To the peals of laughter from his equally tipsy audience, he was reenacting a bullfighting scene from Blood and Sand. When the inebriated bullfighter looked up to see his wife strolling into the bar, he swayed backwards yelling, My God, I've killed the bull. Fortunately for Rudy, Natasha had already downed sufficient cheer to find his drama on the carpet highly amusing. When she failed to reappear, Muzzy decided to see for herself just what had happened to the children. She finally found Rudy seated at the bar with his arms draped around a half-conscious beauty who was not Natasha. He was whispering in the giggling woman's ear, but Muzzy could clearly hear his every word from across the room. Oh, he was saying she would be a successful actress if she ever came to Hollywood. Muzzy's face flushed as she scanned the room in search of her daughter. There, seated in the opposite corner of the bar, was Natasha. With a cocktail held at arm's length, she was seated on a divan and holding court before eight handsome, rapt young men. As the bar's musicians struck up a rendition of Happy Days Are Here Again, Muzzy recruited Uncle Dickie to assist her as she shuffled the children out of the bar and towards a waiting Renault. The Hudnut's chauffeur sat poised behind the wheel of the vehicle, alerted to hit the gas upon Muzzy's nod. Rudy had no intention of leaving the party, was all bluster and thoroughly sloshed. Before anyone realized what had happened, he managed to climb up onto the car's roof. Everyone realized the futility of convincing him that he should not ride atop the Renault with his legs dangling in the chauffeur's face while singing at top volume, Your cares and troubles are gone. Let's sing a song of cheer again. Happy, happy days are here again. Thanks for listening, and my next installment will be Chapter 11, titled Paragraph 4th. I hope you will subscribe to this podcast so you will be notified when the next chapter goes online. As always, you may find your copy of Affairs Valentino on Amazon and all online book-selling venues.